Hello Sea Wolves and welcome to this very cool America's Cup 75 special episode. We're going to uh, really take a good, uh, you know, bit, a bit technical look at the uh, AC-75. Uh, so um, get ready to do some serious nerding uh, today. But of course, we first need to uh, do a little uh, toast. And for the toast today, I have something really, really, truly special in mind. Like really, really... If you told me a week ago that we, as the Sea Wolves, were going to do this, I wouldn't have really uh, believed you, but it happened. And so uh, this particular toast today is actually uh, not going to be my toast. I'm obviously going to toast uh, uh, with you, but I'd like to introduce you now to Troy. Because before we're going to look at the ultra modern AC-75s, I thought, well, what better way to really look at the future than to look at the past. And not just any past, but the past that all of this, where the entire America's Cup came from. And Troy just so happens to be the perfect man to do this toast for us and show us some really, really interesting and relevant stuff from the past. So Troy, over to you. Good morning, Sea Wolves. I'm Troy Sears, owner of the Yacht America, where she's home for it here in San Diego. It's a pretty cool morning, so I have something nice and warm here to drink. I hope you do too, so let's start right away on that. Uh, three, two, one. Mm. Nothing like a little hot chocolate to get your day going. So I'd like to introduce you to the original Yacht America. We're gonna go through some of the technical aspects as to what made the Yacht America uh, so advanced for her time in 1851. I think we'll start first with the help of Ashley helping us with the camera today and the, uh, well, which is my iPhone, uh, uh, starting on the bow. Her hull design was very important. George Steers, the original designer of the Yacht America, basically flipped things around instead of having a really full bow. And Ashley, if you could go straight down the bow, instead of having a very full bow, so you had a lot of volume, to get over waves and things like that. America had the first kind of piercing bow. So much so that when the British first saw the America uh, in 1851, they, they all said, "If well, if America's right, we're all wrong um, because, because of our hull design. Uh, our, our sail plan is a little bit different than 1851. You can see that we have a jib and then stay sail set up, whereas the America in 1851 had just one sail up here where we have the stay sail in the jib. Uh, they had a stay sail boom going all the way out to the end of the bowsprit and just filling that entire triangle. Uh, we uh, personally, I like this configuration because it allows me to have a four stay. So I feel much safer uh, breaking it up into two to have a proper four stay where they did not have a four stay to the bow, just to the end of the bowsprit. Okay, uh, the other part of our whole design is George Steers was very concerned about aerodynamics, not just hydrodynamics. So he made it the boat for a very low freeboard. So for, even though the boat is 42 meters uh, overall, that's including the spar length, so moving the bow forward. Uh, there's a very low freeboard. So that's Maria, our faithful uh, uh, chocolate Labrador. Uh, so even though I'm, I'm just under uh, six foot, uh, uh, and you, so you can see for a boat of her size, very low freeboard, kept a very low profile. So let's go ahead and get on board. Okay, so, so likewise with the deck, um, it was very important that the boat had uh, a, a very uh, low profile. Now we actually have two dog houses now. Ashley's been working very hard on the, on the varnish uh, constantly. It's, it's a never ending project on dog house three. So that's why you see the, that it's about getting ready for another coat. But those dog houses didn't even exist in 1851. So the boat had as clean as possible of a deck from an aerodynamic profile. So, so then also the sail rig was very important. So the boat uh, being uh, got away from the type of uh, square rigging uh, ladders on the shrouds, all those things that made, that were part of the day. And you can first see that, and I, what was very traditional at the time was to have like ladders and stairs going up the mast. You can see his, his rigging was set up to be very uh, aerodynamic, just the shrouds going up, um, still very much a seagoing boat, so our shrouds are, are redundant. We have two sets on each mast. Um, 
The next thing that was really important is to improve upwind sail area and to create a lot of uh, efficiency and a lot less rigging, so it'll be much more dynamic. Had a very simple rig design, so a two-masted schooner. Um, the bass, as you can see, once you come here and go right along the beam, as, as uh, so right next to me, so you can see the angle of the mast. The masts have a very uh, severe uh, rake um, that by doing this, just like for any of you who have windsurfed, uh, this allowed them to, to actually move the mast forward and maintain the same center of effort. And this allowed them to carry a much larger mainsail and then um, and then, then a, uh, a foresail. And then we have both a stay sail and a jib, whereas the original boat just had one sail inside that triangle with the, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more when we get up there. Okay, so, and then same thing up forward, a very simple sail plan. So in 1851, the primary sail plan uh, was three sails. They actually had a flying jib, which actually broke during the race, but the skipper, Captain Brown, didn't like that anyway. So same thing, a very severe uh, rake. Um, and there we go. Um, all right, so looking our way back, here's a famous circular cockpit that, that is so famous with America. Um, uh, and why don't we take a also trip down low? Oh, but before that, a little bit about sails. Another major technological improvement that America had in 1851 compared to the rest of the fleet is America had cotton sails as opposed to flax sails. So, 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 hull design, uh, aerodynamics, sail rig design, and actually the type of technology, the material in the sails were several major advantages. Okay, so let's go downstairs. One thing which I think is super cool is back in, in the mid 19th century, um, they did not strip out the boats to try to make them as fast as possible. Um, yachting was still very much, come on girl. Um, yachting was still very much um, uh, uh, a way to ex express leisure as the world came into the industrial age. And, and so the idea of stripping a boat out to make it as fast as possible uh, was, was not the, the contemporary way to do things. And thank goodness, because this is a lot more comfortable sleep on this boat than being in a carbon fiber uh, uh, tube berth. Okay, so so quick look, actually maybe inside the uh, uh, stateroom. This is where I wake up in the morning and, and uh, to my Seawolves program, uh, and, and then into the main salon. So uh, America had actually three fireplaces, the original America in, 18, you know, in 1851. But for us, uh, it's, it's a very comfortable salon. I do live on board uh, uh, here. Um, now, inside the room, I've always been very passionate about the America's Cup. So I, I have a lot of hack models here. And let's take a quick look at those so we can kind of see the evolution of the America's Cup over time. So here we have the original America in 1851, uh, full skag, very, very full in the back, very fine in the bow, uh, which was obviously the, the radical difference at the time. But uh, you'll see a lot of even the modern AC boats have this uh, skeg dunning, running down the spine uh, of the boats that are going to start sailing in New Zealand uh, this week and uh, start racing this week rather. Um, and it's always interesting that I see that same kind of spine today. All right, so then um, flipping over to this wall here, um, we can see this is the ages, the, the uh, designs as we come into later in the 19th century. Um, and you can see just how radically different the hull designs are uh, going through time. Um, eventually they started to optimize for what I know as the Sawanica rule, uh, which was basically put a premium on waterline length. They basically made, they basically said, uh, uh, here your, the boats are gonna be measured by whatever the waterline length was. And so then you got these massive overhangs and, and really affected uh, naval architecture for generations. My favorite America's Cup boat is over on this wall. This is early 20th century, is Reliance in the center of the room. Thanks, Ashley, for putting it. And you'll see that that, that hull there, uh, even though with a 90 foot long waterline length, is 200 feet uh, overall, and uh, just shows you just how uh, radical they were able to get for maintaining a short waterline length and yet getting over. So when the boat started to sail, it would heel over, that would extend its waterline length and increase its uh, uh, speed. Um, then we go into the, the uh, what, a period of time where the world started to go um, into economic troubles 
And this is the first time we saw that like, kind of like the downgrade. And the first time, instead of being bigger, faster America's Cup boats, um, they actually were starting to, to reverse that trend. And um, due to the, uh, um, the depression in the world, um, uh, and then you started with, to the J class. Now, if you were, if that was your first America's Cup, you would think the J class boats were just the most beautiful things ever in life. But when you consider Reliance had over 15,000 square feet of upwind sail area compared to a J boat, which is about seven and a half thousand square feet, you can see that was a pretty dramatic uh, change. Then we go, the world goes into World War II, and we come out of World War II, and and the technology of the America's Cup boats again changed radically. There's very little interest in the America's Cup as we come out of World War II. So to get interest going again, the New York Yacht Club uh, 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 goes to the courts of New York and asks for a couple of changes to the original deed of gift, the document that was, that was uh, written that started the whole America's Cup to make the boats a little shorter. And it's the first time the boats could go to a, a, a venue without sailing on their own bottoms. So they switched to a, a known design rule at the time, the 12 meter rule. Now for me, that was kind of a, a sad time because I like the idea where the, where the human imagination can develop how fast can you make a boat. But here to keep the America's Cup going, um, they, they uh, reduced it again. Then we go to the catamarans in the early two, in the 2013, in the early part of this last decade. And that's where I also, just, I could not believe we were the uh, uh, hospitality boat here on the America uh, for, for Oracle Team USA. And I, actually watching sailing change uh, right before my eyes during that entire summer. The start of the summer, we were seeing boats still using downwind sails, code zeros, jennikers, things like that. And by the time you get to the end of, uh, uh, of summer, the boats are fully foiling, uh, only using jibs. Um, uh, because they were creating so much apparent wind downwind that uh, it, it no longer needed to, to see uh, any type of uh, downwind sails. And all that happened in a span of months, which was an incredible thing to see. So, so uh, now, of course, we're back uh, into the foiling monoholes, and I'll let Florian take care of that and, and through his conversation today. And, and so it's been a pleasure here to have you uh, join us this morning here in San Diego on America and I think I'm gonna kick back and, and get ready to watch my sea wolves and have one last final sip of hot chocolate before saying goodbye and and um, hope you're having a great day all right bye from San Diego Now, was that a good toast or was that a good toast? I mean, who would have expected that we would have actually Troy Sears and the actual America? I mean, it's, it's a replica, of course, but uh, you know, the, the America that is still in existence in the show. Just so uh, excited about that. And uh, yeah, I hope that that's a perfect bridge for all of you to get into the, uh, the current day AC 75s, which of course stands for America's Cup 75. And the 75, some of you already asked me some questions about that, uh, stands for the length in uh, feet. So it's a boat that's uh, limited to a length of 75 uh, feet. And um, yeah, to, to start, let's talk a little bit about the concept behind the boat. Because it's kind of interesting to know what the thinking was going into this particular design for the race. And as I understand it, both the defenders, so that's Emirates uh, New Zealand, but also the Italian uh, team, now Luna Rossa, uh, they, because they were the uh, you know, official challenger uh, of racket uh, right after the, the New Zealanders won uh, the last time. And uh, they both expressed a desire to go back to monoholes and also to the use of soft sails because uh, the catamarans that had been used in the previous edition had a uh, had a hard wing sail, and um, yeah, they desired to, uh, uh, they they expressed the desire to go back to the normal uh, you know softer uh, sails that you can easily hoist and take down. I'm not exactly what the reason uh, behind that was, but I think because it's maybe just uh, you know more a more traditional way of sailing in that sense. Now, in order to uh, really keep the spectacle and keep pushing the technology, uh, they also uh, agreed that uh, they wanted to go foiling because the speed and the spectacle of that, of course, it's very important for the America's Cup to be you know, the number one uh, duel and to really push technology so that the, the race you know, stays very relevant uh, you know, in, every, uh, in every way and also in the technological aspect. So, uh, so they decided that they wanted foiling 
monohulls. And so uh, that kind of led to the basic design of the AC-75 uh, class. And uh, it's actually designed to be a fairly open contest. So there are a number of things, which we'll get into in a minute, that were, uh, that were restricted or uh, uh, controlled. So uh, the foil uh, booms, for example, uh, those are you know, the same for uh, all of the boats. But there are also many aspects of the boat which are more or less completely uh, open. So they, can be, they could be redesigned by the teams in really any way uh, they saw fit. The, the most, uh, mostly they're just imposing a weight limit. So only 20% of the boat can be you know, dedicated to a certain element, uh, etc. Well, we'll get into those details uh, in a minute. And so uh, for, from that, uh, idea or, or that's let's like, say the the central core idea of this new class to create a monohull that has soft sails that is uh, and that is foiling and then a few restrictions of course to make all the boats you know able to really compete on a similar level to each other but as far as the exact shapes of the hull and many other elements it's you know uh, really an open uh, design contest which uh, makes you know the America's Cup so uh, interesting. Now one uh, feature of the design which I think is kind of interesting to mention here I might say something controversial now but uh, I think it's it's uh, it remains a question whether the AC-75 is actually a uh, monohull and uh, we don't have to get too deep into that in this particular episode but maybe it's interesting to you know have a discussion in the comments and here on the chat on the side you know while we're watching this because I do think it's a very interesting discussion because uh, if you look at boats like uh, Gitana, uh, uh, for example, the uh, the Ultimi, or uh, if you look at uh, you know the catamarans from from last edition and how they foiled, then if you look at the actual foiling platform of the boats, um, yes, we've created one hull that is you know having both of the foil, foils. But like, uh, you know, like the, the trimarans or catamarans that are, you know, foiling right now, they're more or less using the same amount of foiling points. And so, um, you know, when a catamaran is under full speed, usually one of the hulls comes out of the water. And so you're literally really sailing on, you know, your rudder and on your, uh, and on your one hull. And that's actually more or less what we see these mono hulls uh, do so they can sail of course with both of the uh, uh, foils inside of the water but uh, you know when they go on a certain uh, attack they they use the one foil which is kind of you know has the effect of being the one hull of a catamaran because it's so much to the side of the center uh, you know of the actual hull a little bit like a trimaran while they use the other foil as a counter uh, balance much like you would uh, you know, move all your ballast over to the other side if you were racing on a catamaran. So I think it's very interesting from this design that they really wanted to keep the foiling and the, the shapes of the foils are obviously different, uh, very different from uh, what they did in the previous generation on the foiling catamarans in the America's Cup. But I think that uh, interesting perspective to look at this boat actually not really as a monohull per se, there, there is an argument to be made for the fact that it's really a monohull, but to also look at it as, as kind of a design that really crosses between boats as it starts uh, flying, where it kind of starts as a monohull, but then kind of becomes a trimaran or catamaran, depending on uh, how you look at it, as it starts uh, foiling. So I just wanted to, you know, throw uh, that sausage into uh, the dog uh, pen. And uh, uh, now let's just get into the design uh, details and then we'll get to, you know, some of the actual uh, sailing aspects of the boats. So what is prescribed and what is not prescribed in these boats? Now the, the actual rule book is about 75 pages long. So, you know, I summarize it here for you guys to kind of pick out the uh, uh, major points. Don't get angry with me if I left something out that you personally feel is maybe you know very important I have to you know make choices for this type of videos but anyway so the shape of the hull generally speaking is uh, prescribed so the size most of the dimensions and that's why uh, all of the boats have a similar look let's say so they're quite different in the details but the overall shape of it um, is uh, you know is, is very much you, know, you can see that it comes from you know one uh, uh, rule then uh, the foil arm so the arms that the actual foils are on is supplied so the defender 
uh, you know, has appointed one uh, manufacturer who tested this technology and all the teams basically just get uh, the, uh, the foil arm from that one supplier. So they're, they're generally all exactly uh, the same. That also goes for the foil control system. So the uh, inside of these foil, foil arms, there are some control systems and uh, the foils are actually allowed control flaps. So much like the two wings on an airplane where you have you know, flaps and control surfaces, the foils on the AC-75s actually have active uh, uh, controls on them. And so the control systems that lead from the boat to those flaps is also a uh, control thing. So all of the boats have the same technology uh, there then the mast is regulated so it's not uh, it's not given uh, to the teams and made by one manufacturer but there are very strict rules as to how the mast should be constructed what the dimensions of the mast uh, should be so it's you know more or less a one design uh, mast you could say not exactly but very close to and then uh, the rigging is also uh, supplied. So that which attaches you know, the, uh, uh, the mast to uh, the boat, etc., is all uh, supplied. So all the boats are uh, the same in that. Then for all the things that are specifically open. So uh, the foils, the fairlings, the wings and the flaps are all open. So basically, as soon as that foil arm that is supplied ends and you know the, the the piece that goes into the water the two wings that you see on the ends of the foil uh, in all of the designs those are completely open as long as they do not uh, uh, weight wise go over 20 percent of the mass of the entire uh, boat so they're they're maximized to be a certain weight which of course, if you think about the weight of the basic material limits, the size, etc. But that's the way how the organization, uh, you know, choose to control uh, uh, that part. Then the rudder is also uh, fully open. So the design of the uh, rudder, once again, a completely open design, uh, but again, with a 20% uh, weight uh, limit. Um, then there is uh, uh, the sails. And so uh, the sails are also uh, more or less completely uh, open. So they're allowed a head sail and a, you know, GM Genoa uh, Code Zero, etc. But the design of those is completely open with a few limitations. So there are a few limitations on how many battens can be in the sail, uh, there, there cannot be any uh, through holes um, uh, in the sails. There are a number of you know, smaller details that, uh, that you know, they have to uh, confirm to. But other than that, for most of the shapes, etc., the teams are free to make their own uh, uh, choices in that. Uh, and they're also allowed multiple uh, different sails. So they can have a jib, a code zero, and you know, several others um, to uh, uh, rig up their boats. Now the total mass, and this is something that really drives me a little bit nuts. So fully loaded, the AC-75 is set to weigh 7,600 kilos. So roughly seven and a half tons. And that's for a 75 foot racing yacht. Now my little 38 footer um, is, uh, is nine tons uh, when it's fully uh, loaded. So it's literally slightly over half the size of one of these AC-75s, but it weighs uh, more. So it just boggles the mind to think of, you know, how lightweight and how stripped down uh, uh, these boats are to be that large, but yet still weigh that little. Then about the principles of the design, which I think is really quite radical and really also something very different from any other boat uh, that we've ever seen before. It's why it also looks so odd when you first see it. It's like, what is this? It's something that you've never seen before. And that's because the AC-75 is actually the first racing boat that was completely designed from the start with flying in mind. So think about it. Every other boat, we've talked a lot in my show about the Imakas and all the different technology there. And the fact that they are more and more being designed for flying. So the, the previous design of the water going boat is being adjusted and reshaped to accommodate the fact that they're foiling more and more. But the, the DNA, the place where they came from in history is still sailing, is still water-based. So you take something water-based and you're adjusting it to become flying, to become foiling. Whilst these AC-75s were never really designed with water in mind. They start from the water. Yes, that makes them boats. They're foiling above the water and using the foils inside the water to you know, create this flying uh, uh, principle. 
but the boats themselves, the shapes themselves, are actually, if you look at them honestly, completely not designed for dealing with water at all. So the whole boat shape, the whole idea of it, is just to create a flying object, an, an, a water airplane, if you, uh, if you like to uh, call it that way. And that explains the overall design shape. Because when we look at this just radical, radical boat, what we're really seeing is a wing. So it's a very sleek, slender, uh, uh, very simple, actually, wing design. It's as if somebody said, well, what is the simplest flying design that we can make? And, and you know how can we start from that? And that, of course, gives you the simple shape of any wing, whether that's a hydrofoil or an airfoil, doesn't matter, it's the same aerodynamic shape. And it's as if they started with just that basic idea and then said, how can we make this thing start from the water and sail? And so that's a very different design uh, uh, you know, starting point then we have an Amaka that we've been racing for you know, so many years and now we've invented foils. Where do we stick the foils and what do we do then? See, so it really comes from a completely different uh, you know, point of imagination. And so when we look at the AC75, the basic idea of it is really a wing, right? It's just a completely a wing. And if there weren't humans needed to sail this, you probably could just leave it completely as a wing without even those, you know, the kind of the sides where the team will actually be. You could just leave it completely closed and they probably would if that was be uh, uh, the design uh, principle for the race. But of course we need people on board and that brings us to why we see this, uh, this design. So where do you put the people? Where do you put the team on a wing and how do you make sure that the people interfere as little as possible with this flying boat, right? And so that very much explains why we see more or less a flat wing going through the middle where of course the sails are also standing and then we see this nice aerodynamic kind of bulbs on the side which are more or less pushing the air up and then over the team as they are not 100% but more or less hiding behind this kind of aerodynamic shape uh, in front of them which is kind of steering the, the, the really fast flowing air over their heads as they are working on the aft section uh, of the boat. And so that to me really explains the shape of why this boat looks so odd because it's just a flat wing designed to uh, give the whole boat, the whole structure of the boat also as much flying ability as possible and then you know, hide the team as well as possible to not interfere uh, kind of with those uh, aerodynamics. So a really different design brief in that sense. That brings us to the next problem that the designers had to solve. And this is something that uh, if you watched my uh, interviews here with uh, Will Harris of the Sea Explorer de Monaco or with uh, uh, Peter Hirma, the, uh, the former uh, Van der Globe uh, skipper, there is a really interesting problem with foiling boats. And uh, as Will explained, until the boat foils, it more or less acts like a traditional boat. And so as a skipper, the only thing you're thinking about is we need more power, we need more power, we need to increase the sail area, tighten the sails, increase the pressure, increase the power until you get the boat sailing. And then what did Will and Peter say? Well, as soon as the, uh, and Charlie Enright, for example, by, uh, by 11th hour also, as soon as the boat hits, the, hits that 14 knots or so where the foils really start working, all of a sudden you're dealing with a completely different boat. And the amount of power that you need to keep the boat foiling and then really push it to way, way faster speeds is much less than what you need to actually get the boat foiling. And that brings us to the next intricacies of this AC75 design. Because essentially what this boat is designed to do, it, it has to start from the water. So it has to start more or less as a normal boat for all intents and purposes. So at first, the skippers, the teams, need to be able to put as much power into this thing in order to get the foils to work. I don't know the exact speed at which these foils are designed to actually you know, kick the boat out of the water, but if they are similar to uh, you know, most foils that are in use right now, that speed lies somewhere around 12 to 14 knots. That's where the foils really get their power. So the first step for the boat 
is to get up to that speed of 12 or 13 knots. Then as it hits that speed and it starts to fly, then they need to be able to scale down the amount of power really quickly and be able to balance uh, the boat and then you know, increase or lower the power as they need to stably get the boat to the highest uh, top speed uh, that they can. And so that hopefully, you know, for you guys also, is the real uh, is the complexity of the problem that this boat design is uh, is trying to solve right now when we look at the ac75 with that perspective in mind so our are the whole problem that we're looking at as designers as sailors is we're starting as a boat as much power as possible until we're flying then scale down the power to the level where we want it to optimally fly and then switch between you know more power as you're trying to speed up after you made a tack or a jibe etc and it's you know as long as you can keep the boat flying let's say you can power up and power, power down now how does that explain things like the skag for example that troy also talked about this interesting kind of uh, uh you know wing almost underneath uh, uh, the boat and so the reason why I think that they made that kind of sense wise for the teams and for the skippers is uh, as Will, Peter and Charlie explained when the boat starts coming out of the water the transition is very sudden so as soon as you hit that speed it's as if instantly you have a different boat everything is overpowered etc and so my uh, thinking has been over the last few days as I've been researching this is you need something to tell your team, to tell your skipper, not on an instrument, but on something that they can feel when they're on, on the boat, um, that they're about to start foiling. You need to kind of take that transition where it's like we're, we're a sailing boat and then suddenly we become a foiling boat. You need something in between to get more control over that transition. And that is what that skag is because as the boat, so most of the boat, let's say 80% of it lifts out of the water, of course the speed increases a lot, but by extending that skag underneath the boat a little bit, you create, I don't know how long it is, maybe it only lasts for like, you know, five seconds or whatever, but you create a real signal where instead of the boat doing, you know, 10, 11, 12, and suddenly going up 14, 15, up to 20, it'll go much smoother through that transition where you go 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and it doesn't become so much of a bump and actually gives the team the time to, to realize, ooh, we're, we, we feel the difference of being a sailing boat to being kind of the boat with just the skeg still in the water. We start maybe already powering down some of the, uh, some of the sail situations to get ready for that real speed boost as the skag comes more out of the water and then as the boats start really flying and the skag also is you know no longer making contact then hopefully they have the boat already uh, set up and so that's the reason why i think that skag is so important in this design it's to give the team time for that uh, uh, transition extended to that we see that all of the teams have made quite radically different choices as for uh, where to position their team. I got some questions from you over if they're gonna use bike riding, so uh, you know the feet again to provide the hydraulic power, but in this particular America's Cup, that has been banned by the rules, so they can only use uh, their hands. And so uh, uh, all the teams have more or less made very different choices as to where to put uh, the team. So the first question is, again, that idea of maybe they're a catamaran and not a, a monohull is interesting here. Because some teams have, uh, have, have created a necessity for part of the team, I think usually the pilot and maybe one or two uh, grinders, that they have to move between the two sides um, when, they, uh, when they tack or jibe. So part of the team has to actually move positions. And you know, when they turn, you'll see one or two guys kind of run in between the sail and move to the, uh, move to the other side of the cockpit. So that happens while there are other teams that are kind of keeping the entire team uh, uh, stationary uh, in that sense, except I think for the skipper who's then completely uh, uh, on the back. And so they've made quite different choices uh, uh, in that sense to kind of place uh, their teams. And we also see, which I find very interesting, that the amount of control surfaces and indicator systems for the sailors 
are huge. So uh, I saw a few uh, videos where kind of the, the details of the sail are really uh, well visible. And you can see that the sail is just dotted with telltales. And this goes both for their head sails and their main sail. They are just trying to get as much visual information to the skipper and to the team as possible while driving these uh, because you know we've seen a few videos of these AC75s crashing really really hard and uh, the more I understand the design the more I see how these incredible speeds uh, and it, the, the way that the weight and the pressure is distributed within the machine uh, these boats are really on the on the on a knife edge as far as the place where they where they go and the stress that goes on the boat when you see it kind of moving through the water without any significant heel or so that healing moment of course is there it's just all caught by this uh, by this foiling arm and the foiling arm just like the foils in Animaka are providing their own uh, riding moment, but all that force is still, you know, locked up uh, in that arm uh, uh, somewhere. So, I guess through through testing and through you know crashing several times, really, really quite uh, uh, hard, they found out that because these boats are sailing really on a knife's edge as far as balance uh, goes and how they go through turns also, which must create massive loads on all of these foiling systems that uh, they have found hopefully all of the right indicators and really need all those you know, different telltales and symbols and signals to, to make sure that they keep the boat kind of within the uh, you know, parameters set by the designers and by all the different uh, you know, outcomes that they experienced so far to make sure that they uh, you know, don't capsize the boat or break the foils or just overstress uh, uh, this design uh, in any way. Which brings me to the foil canting system. And this is really, uh, a revolutionary stroke of genius I think when you look at what this thing looks like and how just incredibly huge loads this uh, this system must be able uh, to take so uh, all of the boats have the same system for this so still this is a, a given uh, uh, system the foil control uh, system and it's a hydraulic uh, ram which is uh, powered of course uh, by the grinders on board and uh, it's um, yeah, it, it pushes these arms kind of up and down as the boat sail, sails. And if you, you know, can imagine that uh, with the whole boat being about so about uh, uh, nine, uh, 7.9 uh, tons when fully loaded, and uh, and the foils being maxed out at 20% of that, so you have two foils on both sides. Let's say that with the arm, that brings them up to about maybe 30% or 25% of the total weight. That means that those foils are weighing at least two, uh, you know, metric tons. So at least maybe two and a half thousand uh, uh, kilo for that entire arm, including the the levering effect of the fact that that weight is placed so far away from the turning point, two tons plus the water uh, pressure when they're actually under load. I don't know what those things are rated for, but I don't know, 10 tons maybe or something like that? I don't know, would be interesting to, uh, to I couldn't find the, that, uh, that data, but uh, these things are incredible. And I do think that if we think of the America's Cup of being a, a springboard for new technology that maybe hopefully will also find its way into more commercial applications, this is one of the most interesting, I think, inventions in the entire uh, concept of the AC-75. This, yeah, this, this curved uh, foil that can come down and up and that actually balances the boat by putting one of them up and creating a counterweight. Really, really unexpected genius uh, system. So uh, I'll be very interested to see if in the next four or five years, we see maybe some kind of uh, commercial boats actually take up this idea and you know interpret it maybe in a slightly different way so it's more balanced on the safe side than the maximum speed side. But I think there are many, many options uh, around this uh, technology. So just wanted to put that in there. Those are kind of the big above water systems. Now the foil itself, like I said, uh, has two wings and those can be controlled. So it's not just that this foil is creating lift, but they're really uh, uh, steering the boat also in a sense, and they're really actively 
creating this balance as they go uh, uh, through the waves. And so somebody on board, there's only mechanical uh, control allowed. And so I'm not sure, like it's kind of difference uh, from team to team who is controlling the different aspects of the boat. But uh, uh, many of the interviews I checked over the last few days show that uh, many of the teams are really saying things like, well, you know, I'm controlling one, th one part of the boat and it's very, very difficult, but we have several other p uh, people controlling other sides of the boat and we don't even know from each other exactly all of the intricacies of the control that they have to put into this design in order to uh, keep it flying stably. Because as I imagine it, you have the person who is just the wheel, so who is controlling the rudder, uh, but the stabilization of the platform through this flaps that they essentially have inside uh, of the uh, of the foils and also the fact that as the boat you know behaves quite differently when it's sailing on the water when it's kind of lifting up or when it's actually flying and that maybe they have basic positions for the foils where you have just like with an airplane if you're taking off then you're going to have the flaps fully extended in order to create maximum lift but then as you start to actually lift off and you start flying, then you very quickly uh, retract those uh, flaps in order to not have so much, so much resistance to fly stably as you have enough speed. And so I can imagine that uh, many of this type of ideas and processes are also in the AC-75. So you're gonna hear a lot of people talking about the AC-75, not in a specific way like we're doing now, but saying things like, oh, these boats are so complex and it's just so hard to, uh, to drive them. I had one uh, aviation uh, a sailor actually saw him say in an interview that if you think that a plane and all the systems on a plane are complicated, an AC-75 is like five times more complicated than you know understanding a plane and flying a plane. And I think that's why. I think it's not you know hyperbole of like, oh, it's so complicated, it's such an amazing boat. No, these boats are actually really, really super complicated to fly because just like a plane, they have kind of their taxiing stage when they're in the water. They have their, you know, getting ready for flight uh, stage where they have to probably switch several things into a certain position, which makes all of the systems on the boat more, uh, you know, help to actually get the boat out of the water. Then as the boat starts to get out of the water, they maybe adjust all that to an intermediate stage where it helps it to build up speed. And then they, you know, switch it again to like a third uh, set up where it's really optimized for flying and I can imagine that as the boat tacks and jives and slows down and speeds up again that every time they you know the wind falls away and they go lower they have to immediately adjust the boat to the right phase based on maybe their uh, you know speed through the water or I'm not exactly sure which different indicators they're using but for me in this video I kind of wanted to get you all to the point where you can kind of imagine sailing an AC-75 like have a little bit of a feeling of all the different systems that kind of go into that experience and uh, and I think that's um, the closest I can come for for all of you uh, sea wolves here today to kind of uh, uh, describe it so the AC-75 is really an airplane it's a uh, it's an airplane that takes off from the water and isn't able to you know to leave the water so it, it needs the foils to keep flying um, but other than that it's really actually not a boat i think we could legitimately call it the first non-sailing boat it's a sailing airplane more or less it just starts uh, uh, from the water if that makes uh, uh, sense to you guys just you know fun fun idea I wanted to uh, throw in there uh, so that's the boat kind of from an experience and more of the larger parts uh, discussed the final two things that I think are really really interesting uh, to look at the first one is the overall design of the hull so when you look at all four of the boats from a, a larger distance you'd immediately think oh these four boats are a class they're more or less the same but as you get closer and you look at the difference between you know the the, the details on the hull shape and, the, and how they are curved you look at uh, team new zealand's uh, hull versus that of american magic for example they couldn't be more different the like intensely flowing very curvy hull of team new zealand and then when you look at the American Magic Hall, like that's definitely also very much designed. You can see that there's a lot of calculation went into that, but it looks a lot less uh, curved. It looks a lot more, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, 
not so intensely curved as the New Zealand one. And when I think about the idea that Airbus, so a company with just you know, decades of experience in flying specifically, uh, has of course largely contributed to designing the uh, American Magic shape, let's say. So they must know what they're doing, right? And when you look at the uh, New Zealand team, who are uh, one of the reasons that they really won the previous uh, America's Cup is that they really did so much in-house uh, testing, let's say, in-house uh, design. I saw several videos of them just spending days and days and days out on the water, uh, you know, with, with basically a raft with foils underneath it and just pulling that with a speedboat and just testing every different design and every different control surface, really perfecting the art of foiling by themselves, just, you know, in a river, uh, you know, behind the behind their, their hangar or wherever they were working from, just doing the research. A little bit like that scene from that movie Wind that I'm sure that all of you are watching this have seen and, and really love. Just, you know, white knuckle silence, let's say, and just pushing it through and figuring it out themselves. And so I find it hugely interesting to see how radically different they are and how much the Italian hall, for example, again, is much more sleeker and seems much less defined in a in a sense like doesn't have so much curves seemingly and uh, and the Ineos Team UK again quite uh, quite different you know the, the overall design is the same but you see different curves in different places uh, a bit more of an angular some you know angular shapes also uh, in there and so none of us know what exactly is going to be really functioning the best and we know that the, the, the races that are you know, happening this weekend, basically starting actually tomorrow, are not really, you know, nobody's going to really push the boat to the absolute maximum because there's no points to be won in this race. It's just, you know, getting a feel for each other for the first time and seeing what happens. And they're all going to keep the real top speeds and, you know, top abilities of their boat carefully uh, veiled, let's say. But you just know that all of those, those details on the hull shape are going to make, of course, a large difference. And then uh, finally, there's of course the engines that are driving it all, which is the sails, uh, which is also very, very interesting. Because uh, as they've been uh, testing, uh, I've seen a lot of, uh, uh, of the boats kind of, uh, uh, you know, using bigger, bigger head sails, smaller head sails, seemingly really trying to find the limits uh, of the boat. And so I don't think also that the teams themselves really know uh, what the limits of the boats uh, uh, are and that, uh, that within the sail design also there seems to be just a lot of, uh, of, uh, of subtle uh, differences. And it's obvious that by the amount of telltales and you know, like uh, visual signals and cues that they've built into these sails, to kind of tell the skipper and you know possibly s several other crew members on board exactly what is going on as far as the aer aerofoils that are going through this boat i think i don't i haven't ever seen uh, sail designs that are so focused also on communication on on taking almost every square centimeter uh, of the sail you know like when you look at the at the sail basically at every batten there are telltales throughout the entire length of the sail, whereas, you know, I've been on, on plenty of boats and also on boats that, you know, were used for racing. And then they'll have, you know, five, six telltales somewhere, you know, in the front of the sail, maybe on two, three places, but never all throughout the sail. Literally any part of surface where you could possibly put a telltale, they put one. And that tells me that uh, the, the, the tolerances of these boats are maybe a lot smaller than we think so the safe way to sail them really hard that's a very narrow window as far as all the different factors that they have to keep in balance and you know having a huge array of telltales there that's probably there for a reason right there must be some warning in there or some cue to the skipper to the rest of the team there that is so important that they really don't want to miss it and so i'm not exactly sure what the, the innovation within the sale itself is, because that's, as we can all imagine, top secret uh, right now, and one of the real weapons that all of the, uh, the teams are going to be using against each other. But I think the fact that all of the teams are so focusing on just great communication from every inch of the sale that they can find, that definitely tells you 
how important uh, of a role they're going to be playing in this America's Cup. And so, uh, yeah, that's it for uh, my look at the ACE 75 with all the information that we have right now. I hope you uh, enjoyed this little uh, nerd out slash deep dive, uh, uh, opened of course again uh, by Troy, the, uh, the owner of the uh, America schooner that this whole uh, crazy race is actually uh, uh, you know sprung from uh, back in history so Troy again also very much thank you for uh, you know helping the sea wolves uh, out couldn't believe it when I heard that uh, you know he was also uh, a fan so super nice and uh, yeah thank you all for watching today and make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't yet make sure to hit that uh, subscription bell and uh, uh, yeah, go to the website seawolvestv.com for uh, more info. And if you want to uh, back the channel, help me to you know make bigger productions uh, like this. You know, go into studios sometimes to do interviews or get external people like Troy to uh, you know be able to uh, contribute to the channel. Please uh, you know become a backer or a patron. Go to the website seawolvestv.com, and there's just many options for you to uh, choose from there. And it really really helps to you know, get the sea wolves into more and more interesting places and interesting topics. So again, thank you very much for watching and I look forward to uh, see you again tomorrow with a fresh cup of coffee. Ciao.